afternoon. I'm Kim Melnick, school board chair, and the mini retreat is hereby convened at 12.02 on this 23rd of January, 2023. Members of the public will be able to observe the mini retreat through live streaming on school on schoolboard.vbschools.com forward slash meetings forward slash live. It's also broadcast on VB TV channel 47 and on Zoom. Thank you to those that have joined us in person and online. We appreciate your company. Madam Clerk, will you please announce those school board members in attendance? In chambers, we have Chairwoman Melnick, Vice Chair Franklin, Mrs. Anderson, Mrs. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Owens, and Mrs. Riggs. And via Zoom, we have Mrs. Manning. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right, we're going to get started straight away, but just so the public knows, um, I'll just do a brief overview. Um, we're going to start with our 2024-25 ODS selection process, followed by a preview of process and timeline for the development of the 25 through 30 gifted education plan, um, and then closing with the discussion on our school board summer retreat topics. And so with that, I welcome the Department of Teaching and Learning um, for our 24-25 ODS selection process. Hello, Ms. Carlucci. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Melnick, Vice Chair Franklin, School Board members, Dr. Robertson. My name is Danielle Colucci, and I serve as the Chief Academic Officer in the Department of Teaching and Learning. This afternoon, I am joined by our new K-12 and Gifted Programs Director, Dr. Crystal Wilkerson, Dr. Lorena Kelly, Executive Director of Elementary Teaching and Learning, and Gifted Education Coordinators. Also joining us is Dr. Plucker from the Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Plucker will share research and information related to gifted education in support of the work we will do together this afternoon to make decisions regarding student selection for Old Donation School. Our objective for today's presentation is shared on this slide. Please take a moment to review it. To accomplish this singular goal, our time will be divided into three parts today. First, we will share state requirements related to the decisions that need to be made. Second, Dr. Plucker will share research as related to the decisions being made. And finally, we will review each area for which we need the school board to make a decision. We understand this level of decision making is best achieved through collaboration and that you may have questions. For this reason, we have embedded question and answer and collaboration time throughout the session. At the conclusion of our time with you, you will also be briefed on the process for developing the next five-year plan for the education of the gifted. Let's begin now with background information and state requirements. As you can see here, Kemp's Landing opened as a magnet school in 1995, serving middle school age students in grades six through eight. In 1998, Old Donation Center opened and it served grades two through five. Our community and school stakeholders have diverse views related to Old Donation School. This division has heard from dissatisfied parents and staff regarding ODS as a standalone building and the selection process used since its inception. Know that we are not alone in this challenge where there is a school serving the singular focus of, for just gifted students. It is our understanding some other divisions in the Commonwealth have eliminated schools that once stood alone to serve only gifted learners, and out of approximately 130 public school divisions in the Commonwealth, VDOE recently told us that they are only aware of one other 
school division that has a school like ODS. While our objective today is narrow, you can see it will be certainly very complex. Let's review what the Commonwealth expects public school divisions to do regarding identification of gifted students and placement. To identify a student as gifted in Virginia, school divisions must use multiple criteria. If a child is identified, they are provided differentiated instruction by personnel trained in educating gifted students. Virginia Beach is fortunate as all gifted students are provided instruction by a gifted cluster classroom teacher and a gifted resource teacher who are trained in gifted instructional strategies, extending and enriching curriculum, and differentiating to meet the needs of gifted learners. Additionally, as you are aware, gifted students also have the option to apply to attend school at ODS. Divisions must also ensure identification of students is designed to seek out students whom accurate identification may be affected due to their circumstances, such as being economically disadvantaged, having limited English proficiency, or being disabled. In 2017, the Virginia Advisory Committee for the Education of the Gifted published Increasing Diversity in Gifted Education Programs in Virginia at the VDOE's request to investigate best practices for approaches in identification and to assist school divisions in reviewing their gifted program processes. In your school board materials, you also have federal documents that were released to ensure non-discriminatory practices are in place. We have flagged page five through six in the Virginia document and pages 16 and 19 in the US Department of Education Office of Civil Rights document to ensure you have this information. Next, let us briefly immerse in research from the field. Dr. Jonathan Plucker is a professor of education and associate dean of faculty affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. He has come back to us today to visit Virginia Beach City Public Schools to support our work today and share research from the field. Some of you have had the pleasure before of hearing Dr. Plucker speak and collaborating with him. He advises many divisions and is renowned for his expertise in the gifted mind and educating gifted children. He has presented information and audit, audit feedback with the previous school board in Virginia Beach. As Dr. Plucker shares today, please feel welcome to jot down notes or questions you may have as we have built in 10 minutes after he briefs us for question and answer time. It is our honor now to introduce Dr. Jonathan Plucker. Thank you so much. It's good to be back uh, with you again, uh, and um, I thought I, I'm just going to talk for about five or ten minutes or so to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I was going to do slides, but then I thought you've probably seen enough slides already today, and you're going to see more. So um, we're, gonna, we're just going to we're, we're just going to go old school. Um, so during my previous visit, two to three years ago, three years ago, three years ago, um, uh, the previous administration and the previous board were very concerned about whether you were doing the best you could to, equi to equitably identify and serve all of your advanced students. Uh, the data was pretty clear that you were not, like every other division in the Commonwealth. Um, uh, and we talked about very, very specific strategies for both um, finding all those students um, who are advanced and then um, uh, providing them with the uh, level of rigorous education services that they need. I, let, me, let me take a um, sort of a half step back and say that a good colloquial definition of an advanced student is a student who needs more. 
Um, more is pretty much defined locally. They may need more in math. They may need a uh, faster pace. They may need more depth. But a student who the regular curriculum is not serving well in terms of maximizing how much they can learn, how much of their talents that they can actually develop. So um, it's a colloquial definition, but I think it actually works fairly, fairly well. Are you finding all of your students in this division who need more? And then are you finding ways to get them the more that they need? Um, I gave you lots of strategies last time. Um, uh, and I have to say, um, uh, a lot of them really seem to have worked. You have found a lot more students who would benefit from advanced education. Um, but in addition to helping you find the students that you are missing, I also cautioned the board that, um, as I like to say, you need to make more pie. It's not a matter of slicing up what you currently offer in smaller pieces for everyone. You have to offer more advanced services if you find more advanced students. Um, I think you did a really good job. Uh, universal screening, uh, using local norms, front-loading programs of finding those students who, who um, you had been missing, uh, but I'm not sure you actually came through in providing a lot more services to, than, than to those students. Um, you did provide more services. You expanded ODS, which is exactly what I recommended. Um, if you find more students, you have to serve more students. Um, but I think you f didn't realize how many more you were going to find, and that's really the root of your sort of issue and controversy now, is you um, doing all the things that research tells us to do, you found so many more talented students. That's a huge, huge accomplishment. Most other divisions in this state would kill for that accomplishment. That is something that you should be very, very proud of. You haven't been able to serve all of those students necessarily at the level that everyone would like to see. That's sort of the root of why we're here today, I think. Um, uh, so again, you got that first part right. You found more, um, you're serving more, but you're not finding ways to serve them all at that very high quality level that we all that we all seek. This is this is sort of a growing pains problem. Um, if you weren't doing the first part right, the second part wouldn't matter. There's a lot of school divisions, there's a lot of school districts across this country who I would love to have this problem. So like, this is a good problem to have. You have done a good job of finding more talented students. Um, um, how do we find ways to provide services for all of those students? You currently use what I call a um, hybrid model. Um, as you just heard, it's not terribly common within uh, Virginia now. Uh, it, used to be much more common, uh, but throughout the country, you do have lots of districts that use this hybrid model, and that's essentially one or two magnet schools, and then local services for students who aren't being served in that magnet school um, within those neighborhood school zone schools, whatever you call them, uh, sending schools. Um, uh, hybrid models, I've never seen them work well. Could they work well, theoretically? Absolutely, that's why people try them, right? It makes sense in lots of ways. In practice, it just never seems to work. Um, it just never seems to work. There's uh, political issues, uh, logistical issues. Um, so I favor either having ample magnet school opportunities in space or not having them at all and having really high quality services embedded within every single school. Um, that's a philosophical argument. Uh, the um, uh, studies that I have seen are fairly agnostic on which one tends to serve, serve students' needs better. Um, they're both tricky and they're not easy. If it were easy, we wouldn't even have to talk about this, right? It's very, very tricky stuff. Um, the hybrid model though, um, uh, you always seem to get stuck with too few seats to meet, the, uh, to meet the demand for students who need more. And then it's really hard once you have that model to also provide equally high quality instruction back in those neighborhood schools for the students who need it. And so you're sort of caught between kind of serving all the students a little bit as opposed to serving any of them exceptionally well. Um, uh, so, um, 
my recommendations, and uh, I should also say, um, when it was uh, publicly announced that I would be here, boy, have I heard from people. Um, I'm sure none of you have heard from anybody, right? Um, uh, uh, I, I do have to say, um, I want to give credit to Virginia Beach parents. I've gotten many, many, many emails. Um, uh, they were all very, very measured and very, very thoughtful. I actually don't see that in many um, uh, school districts. There's a lot of uh, frustration and anger and sort of logic tends to flow away whenever that happens. That is not the case here. Um, there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of frustration. But I was surprised. Every single parent who has contacted me um, uh, sent very specific ideas for ways that the district could move forward. Um, I, I just don't see that very often. And uh, I really like some of these ideas, to be absolutely honest with you. So um, many were along the lines of what I was thinking anyway to help you out here. Um, so let me just talk very, very briefly about um, the, um, about the various models. Um, so again, I generally suggest a one or the other model. Either you go with those magnet school models. Um, in, in that case, for you, it would be um, having um, sort of a, a second ODS. I'm not saying it has to be a standalone school. I'm pretty sure you don't have a lot of money lying around to just build a school tomorrow, right? Um, uh, but there are school, within school models, there are sort of different ways that you could structure that. Um, uh, you'd probably need at least as many seats as you currently have in ODS to do that. that, that that's going to be logistically challenging. Um, uh, the other possibility is to move in the other direction, um, uh, which is to only have services embedded in every single school. Um, uh, the the uh, challenge there is to make sure that they are very high quality services. Um, in most districts that try the hybrid model, um, uh, they spend so much attention on what happens at that one or two, at those one or two um, special schools, if you will, that the quality of the advanced services in the uh, neighborhood elementary schools tends to be significantly lower. Um, that, that is definitely sort of the root of your parent concern here. Um, and uh, from what I've observed, they're probably, they're probably onto something there. Uh, the quality is definitely not nearly as rigorous in those local um, um, programs. Um, so I was trying to think, is, is, there, is there a middle ground that, that, that you can use that the research would support that would also guarantee high quality services for all of these students? Um, and it was actually something that a parent suggested to me, I think on Sunday night, um, and I was thinking in this direction anyway. Uh, the argument was um, you could kind of have a middle ground model where you still have an ODS, but take advantage of the fact that that ODS curriculum is a world-class curriculum. Um, I said that the last time that I was here. I still believe that that is absolutely true. It is a very good curriculum. Why can't that curriculum be ported over to some of your neighborhood schools using things like cluster grouping, so it wouldn't have to be in every single school, which would require intense professional development, probably. Um, so then you could be clustering those students and ensuring that they're getting that same very rigorous world-class curriculum. Um, I thought that was actually a really interesting suggestion. Um, I, was, I was thinking, you know, how, how can you get that into every single neighborhood school? That would be very, very difficult. It would take you years, probably. It is a lot of training you'd have to do, et cetera. Um, but you have very talented gifted education teachers in this, um, in this uh, school division. Um, I don't see why you couldn't cluster them in certain schools. So it's kind of a middle ground model. It is, um, I realized, kind of a hybrid hybrid model, which is um, struck me as a little bit ironic. But that could actually work for you, I think, something like that, um, unless you want to go in either of those other two directions, um, which would both be difficult. Um, you're kind of stuck in between, if that makes sense. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, um, and this is a bit of a tangent, uh, just in talking to um, building level staff, teachers, principals, um, one thing that comes up is um, 
uh, the credit for uh, student test scores for students who go to OTS, who go to ODS, stays at ODS. The principals would not mind if sort of the sending school got credit for that student's success. So right now, um, ODS's test scores look amazing. They should, right? Like they absolutely should be off the charts amazing. Um, uh, what does that really tell you though, right? It, doesn't really tell you all that much. Um, even if you keep that ODS model, um, even if you add another ODS, um, uh, we, we've, we, we have seen this um, in states like Ohio with um, alternative high school programs. Um, principals don't mind sending their students to the alternative offsite programs because if it works, they get the credit for the student having graduated from high school. I think you could use something like that here where uh, the sending principals, um, uh, it becomes in their best interest to make sure that a student is being challenged no matter where they are, with them, in a different building, because it comes back to credit the neighborhood school. Um, that's just a small little policy quirk that you have here that I think would actually help in some ways. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm going through that quickly. We could go into the logic behind it in more depth if you would like. But um, that's just something else that I've heard as I've been working here um, over the past couple of years. So uh, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop there um, and see if you have questions, comments. Thank you for your information, sir. Uh, the questions that came to mind during your presentation are the following. If I heard you correctly, you indicated that uh, the requirements for equitable distribution of these services is not being met, and it's not being met anywhere in the state, again, if I heard you correctly. And if that's a correct understanding, the question that it begs is, are those requirements realistic? Since no one is meeting them, is the problem with the schools or is it the problem with the goal that is being sought? Uh, very good question. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Is that? I've got one more, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, let me, let me, let me um, tackle this one first. Um, no one in the country is making the hybrid model work well. Um, others are doing a pretty good job of service delivery, uh, and, that's, and that's true here, too. Um, I think where you're ahead of most of the other divisions within the Commonwealth is um, identification. You've done a much better job on the identification side, um, and you have found lots of students who are performing at high levels that you were just missing before. Um, you are way ahead of many other districts of similar size in that. Um, but, then that, but then that created your problem because then you're feeding those students into a service delivery model that is really hard to make work well. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, where, where the breakdown is. Um, as to your bigger, bigger existential question of is it the goal, um, uh, again, I, I would fall back on that colloquial definition, sir, and say, uh, are you giving more to all the students who need more? I think you've done a good job finding the more students, but you're just not at the service delivery yet. I think that's still a very laudable goal, um, and it certainly fits well within Virginia statute. So, Well, along that line then, uh, if we are finding more that can qualify to be a part of this system, has that been as a result of, let me play devil's advocate, mm -hmm. have we just lowered the bar and now all of a sudden there's this outpouring of people who qualify, whereas before there wasn't as much. Have we changed the, the, the metrics, if you will, in order to accommodate more kids that previously wouldn't have been accommodated? Uh, very fair question. That's a question that I had when I started poking around a couple months ago on this issue. I do not believe that that's the case here. Um, uh, you've you broadened the pool of indicators, but it was the universal screening and using local norms that really expanded that pool. And all that that does is find students who are already high performing that you were missing before. Um, so I, I don't think, I mean, there are people within 
Virginia Beach who think you have lowered the bar. They've made that very, very clear to me. Um, uh, but in digging into it, um, I personally believe we don't need to lower the bar to be more equitable and, and, and to do this well. Um, I don't think that's really happened here. Uh, but I, I absolutely acknowledge there's a range of public opinion on that. I don't think that's what happened. I think, I think you've just done a better job of finding students who need more. We're so good, we're creating problems. Uh, that's, that's, that's basically accurate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You. you brought this on yourself, and it's a good thing to have brought on yourself. So um, I'm so proud of our division. So I listened to you, and, and, and you basically challenged us. And I think, honestly, challenge accepted, but we just didn't. We didn't, we did not, I mean, we, all right, let me back up. We have identified more students. That, and as you said, that's a great problem to have. It's a great problem to have. Um, and if I'm hearing you correctly, it's not a problem we're going to be able to solve tomorrow. Because what's happening now, and I'm sure you're aware, is now our pool, it's being ranked by outside entities. Children are now being ranked by a, 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 a test score, a single test score or two test scores. And we don't have a full picture of everybody. We're just hearing from some. And no fault of those that are letting us know. It's just that what, what do we do? So I, I guess really I want someone to answer the question for me, and I think the best is to incorporate it in, in our schools so that we're servicing everybody, which has always been my concern from the beginning, are those students who, who are left unidentified. Um, a lot of students in our Title I schools, um, and we've kind of whittled away at the process um, in order to... To, to select those students, we've we've taken out all of the the barriers that might have created those problems. But um, we are not in a position to build another school, and we are woefully behind with our with our CIP now. So um, I'm going to listen some more. I, I I just want you to solve this problem for us, really, like <laughs> at the podium. No pressure. Um, okay. Uh, I I do want to comment on a couple things that you talked about. It. Um, uh, I, I also want to say I, I, I do not want to come across being critical of parents at all. I hope that has not happened. Um, uh, again, their ideas have been really good. They have. They've been fairly clear-eyed here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been in a roughly similar situation with one of my children a while ago now. Um, I was livid. I wouldn't have been this. And I, my better half tells me I was not as clear-headed about it um, as many of these parents are being. So um, they have a right to be upset in many ways. Um, uh, so I, I don't want to discount their concerns in any way, shape, or form. I do. Um, the fact that you're having to use a lottery. Random, random. random selection. <laughs> It's not a lottery, and so it's a random selection. We random do selection. We, we do have a lottery system for our public charter school. Right. We do, and that's anybody who applies, they go in the bucket. You have to qualify to get into this random selection. So, um, For your random selection, um, whenever I hear that dealing with advanced education, my immediate knee-jerk reaction is, why didn't you expand services? Like, you're, all right, all right. I mean, um, it's an admission that you don't have the services that you should have. Um, or else you wouldn't need to do it, right? And so, um, and again, backtracking a little bit, I, the problem with, with the hybrid school model is that it's really hard to expand services past a certain point in a fixed building like ODS. I encouraged you to fill, to fill the building. You easily did that. But you found a lot more students who need more challenge. Um, you, it's really hard to expand buildings, um, like you said. Um, uh, very, very difficult. Um, so it's just it's not a great expandable model. Um, and whenever 
uh, whenever you're sort of artificially constraining supply of advanced education, you will always have equity issues. It's just a statistical fact, right? Um, uh, you're doing such a, like, again, such an improved job um, in uh, finding a more diverse pool of talented students within this school division, but you're just not being able to provide the services. Um, that said, politically, moving away from a magnet school model is incredibly difficult. Uh, Montgomery County, Maryland tried it five or six years ago now. Um, uh, it's still a very bumpy transition for them because uh, people see the value in that model and mm -hmm. they're just not 100% trusting that what you're going to provide in the local school is of similar quality. And you know what? They should, they absolutely should question that because it almost never happens, right? Um, Montgomery County certainly ran into that where they made this really quick transition away from the model, more school embedded services, the design was perfect and there wasn't that much quality control on the quality of services within the local schools. Parents perceived that if anything, quality went down. We could, we could probably argue that. Um, uh, it didn't. It didn't go up, um, and so parents were upset. Students became upset, being it was so much better before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I, I do think sort of the idea of clustering in a few neighborhood schools, if not all of them, that 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 may be sort of an intermediate step for you, but it is one way that you can, um, if not guarantee sort of foster really high quality services within each of these schools. That said, if you move in that direction, um, as a parent, I would expect some, some reasonable set of guarantees that you are monitoring quality rigor so that it's not just a political solution, it's actually an educational solution for these students. Um, I don't know how you do that because I've not seen anyone do it well, mm -hmm. but just you know, making sure that the quality of that cluster model is uh, very high quality and very challenging. Right now, I would, I would say it's probably not. Um, so how, how do you put that into place? I'm, I'm kind of making it sound easy. That's still hard, but I think it's a little bit easier than building a second or third school <clears throat> or trying to do that in every single one of your neighborhood schools. That's a really heavy lift. Yeah. I, think, I think you can get there eventually. Um, but I think we need to be realistic here about how, 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 how as you're planning over the next five years, um, do you start making that transition while increasing the quality of the advanced services that your current identified students are getting? That's kind of the challenge before you, right? Yeah. Um, and I think sort of an intermediate approach like some of those parents have been talking about makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Weems? Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess the confusion that I have is like, what is the purpose of the standalone building? Who is it for? And I think that's what we've got to decide first because if we're identifying more mm -hmm. children and and you said mm -hmm. we're identifying high performing students but a high performing student is not the same as a gifted student and they're very different so you know and, and i think that we've gotten to now we've we've heard quotes between 25 and 30 percent of these students are identified which doesn't match up to any any expectation or any thought that I have from other divisions, that seems like a very, 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 very high percentage. So, so is the bill is the standalone building for high performing students? Is this for thirty percent of our students? So I guess that's the confusion that I that I have. And I've had students that have spent some time in the standalone, and I've had a student and granddaughter who has been in the cluster um, part. And I do agree. Um, I don't think it's a perception. I think it's reality that the cluster gifted program in the individual schools is nowhere close to what students are getting in the standalone building. And I've witnessed it as a grandparent and a parent. Um, and I don't think that's perception. So, um, but, but again, if we're, if we're gonna identify 25 or 30% and it's gone up, you know, I've been on the board for 20 years and that number has increased, are we then gonna identify 
35 and 40 percent, and then 45 and 50 percent. I mean, and then the standalone building is going to be completely limited. Um, so that's just my kind of confusion and frustration with it, because now I just don't really know who the standalone building is for. And, and I do think that there is a difference between high-performing students and gifted, because I had, but I had two different types living under my roof. I mean, I think there's sort of two sets of issues here. Um, let me let me talk about the other one that um, that you touched on first, sort of the minor issue. Um, I mean, it makes sense that when you have a hybrid model, the standalone tends to be a much high, higher quality of advanced services, mm -hmm. right? Because that's where you're sending your highest performing students. That's where people tend to focus their energy for advanced education. It's assumed that you've identified all of them who need more, right? Um, so it just makes sense, and then others feel like they're off the hook. Um, so hey, we don't we don't we don't need to worry about advanced education here because that's what the standalone school is for. That's what ODS is for. Um, uh, I, and that's also why moving away from that model becomes so tricky, is that you've got to convince everyone in every building that no, advanced education, much like special education, is every single educator's business in every single school. Um, that's just a really hard shift. That's a really hard shift. And many of you will not have the training for it, uh, again, which is why it just takes time and, you know, resources, I guess. Uh, you know, like the uh, percentage issue, um, I, hear, I, hear that, I hear that a lot in Virginia Beach. Um, and again, this is uh, more of a philosophical question. Uh, when I come at it from a policy pragmatic perspective, my issue is more, well, if you're finding that 30% of the students need more, I really don't care what you label them. I, I just want you to make sure that you're giving them more of what they need. Mm -hmm. And if that means that 15% sort of fit that very traditional, conservative, highly gifted mm -hmm. set of definitions, great. And then you've got another 15 to 20% that still need a, a more advanced, accelerated curriculum. Um, I, I don't really care what the labels are. Just make sure that they're all getting more, that they're all getting those advanced services. Um, that's a level of differentiation that research tells us is very, very difficult, um, which is why saying, oh, it'll just be embedded in every single classroom never seems to work. Um, it's just very, very hard to do. That, that, that level of differentiation is hard. Um, but I've seen school districts that, that are the 25 to 30% range. Um, it's, not, it's not uncommon. Um, it doesn't fit the old traditional models where it would be 4 or 5% of students. But that just led to other problems. We were missing so many students who didn't fit the stereotype of what a highly gifted student was. You have moved away from that. It's probably a fair question to ask, have we moved too far? I personally, in looking at the data, don't think you have. Um, but the only way to find that is to provide all of those students with the more that you think they need. And if they all succeed, then I would say, okay, 30% is about, about, you know, right. If 15% succeed in that model, then you need to recalibrate a little bit. But it's hard for you to answer that because you're not offering more to all of them who you've identified. So it really becomes sort of a conceptual question. Oh, yeah, Ms. Franklin. Okay, so my husband is a huge Star Trek fan, so I know way more about Star Trek than I need to. But, you know, in Star Trek, there is the Kobayashi Maru, which is a no-win scenario that cadets have. I feel like that is, we have the Kobayashi Maru right here <laughs> in education. How do you do this? I have been on this um, gifted committee for over three years. And it's an amazing committee. I've learned so much um, through my time of serving there. So you have talked about how we have kind of, you know, propelled off that first layer, which is identification, which I've seen huge changes since just in the three years since I've been on the board. You know, so one of my questions as we figure out our path from here, the opt-in versus opt-out, I would very much, that's question one for me, what do you feel about that in terms of does, which one makes sense to you, parents opting in or parents opting out? Um, opting out, absolutely. Okay, so thank you for that. Okay. Do you want me to elaborate on that at all? Sure. Or just, sure, please. Um, uh, I think one of the biggest developments we've seen in K 12 education period um, is the slow rollout across various states of opt out models versus opt in models. 
um, opt-out models, just I, all, all, of, all of the stats on them are so much more positive. Mm -hmm. It's much more inclusive. Um, uh, it seems to really benefit students who live in more um, rural communities, lower income students, mm -hmm. uh, racialized minority students primarily. Um, I, North, North Carolina is probably, um, is it okay to compare you guys to North Carolina or is that race There is hackles? no comparison. Okay. To um, uh, uh, in a state to your south, um, they are doing um, auto, um, automatic enrollment just in math. Um, and they've been doing it since about 2018. Uh, they kind of refined it during the pandemic. So we're just starting to see sort of what I would consider to be sort of true data coming out now. Um, and what they found is that students who were high performing in math uh, were not overwhelmingly being placed in advanced math. There was no excuse for that, yeah. right? I mean, students had already shown that they need more and that they can thrive with more. And then you're making a judgment call saying, well, not really. Mm. Um, I'm very sensitive about it because that happened to my daughter too, where they just couldn't acknowledge that she was an A-plus math student. And they kept placing her in the mid-level math programs mm. every single year. And it drove me bananas because I would say her test scores are in the top, like the very, very top, 99th percentile. She gets A's and A-pluses and everything. Why do you keep placing her below? And so I'm a big fan of automatic enrollment for that. Um, uh, North Carolina um, has almost completely closed that gap. The students who qualified and weren't getting placed in advanced math. And I think it's the opt-out that's the primary okay. mechanism. So I could give a few other examples. Uh, North Carolina is probably the most comprehensive mandatory program. Um, and then there's lots of problems with opt-in, too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, just uh, just the whole the social, yeah. social capital thing. Mm -hmm. Some families have social capital and understand the system. Some do not. Some understand appeals processes. Some do not. Mm -hmm. And the opt-in part, I think, is very unfair to lots of families. Okay. Um, so, so we actually had that model, and I think that was right. one of the reasons that it's we expanded fantastic. services, um, you know, to, to groups that were not... Um, seen opportunities before. So with that being said, um, my second question, I only have, th I have three, but my second question is the priority versus opening up expanding services, what you just agreed was a priority. The GCAC committee has agreed that that was a priority in prior years. Um, but now what you, you've described that now we're in layer two, which is now we have to make sure that we are meeting and expanding those services so that we have got, you know, more for more people. Now, I've got to tell you, the time that I have spent in the schools, one of the, I think, observations that I've had is that at the cluster level, we have got a great number of students that are getting great service. However, maybe there are some that are getting we're not meeting expectations, I would say. And that's, I, I think that's one thing that we have, you know, when, when is it more? When are we meeting expectations? And what is the expectation for more? I think more is a very loose term, you know. Mm -hmm. More means one thing to one and not one thing to the other. You know, um, Mr. Callan and I just went on a school visit with the GRT. And, you know, I mean, these elementary school students were just thriving. And one of the things the GRT said was that, we are giving, we are training the teacher, and then the teachers are not just giving it to just two or three of their gifted students. I mean, they're applying those principles in the classroom so that they can lift up all, all those, right? So, so part of that is, I guess that's part of my question. So now we're doing great with the, the identification part. You know, um, how do we expand services to provide that more so that we are meeting expectations? Or how can we meet expectations? Um, well, I, the, the, the key word there is expectations, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very, very tricky. Um, there, there are certainly some, some parents who will never accept that what's happening in the local school clusters is as good as what's happening in ODS. So let's not say that, that it's, it's the same. Right, it's not. Okay, it's, okay, and, so. and I think we would all acknowledge it's not, it's not the same. Right, but it's let's say, how do, but how do we provide in this hybrid model 
an opportunity that the more that we are providing at that cluster model is going to decrease the gap between expectations and what between the two. Yeah. I um uh I don't know what you can do to reduce that expectation gap. Um, I do think doing a really careful audit of the curriculum of what's happening in, in, in that clustered approach and being able to document how it does match up or does not match up to what the ODS students are experiencing would be a really important curriculum audit. I think that would be worth your time. Um, some, some people in this district think it's a massive gap. Others are like, no, not really. It, it, it may very well be school by school, right? Mm -hmm. If just things are lined up the right yes. way, people who are really into advanced education, maybe it's just as good, if not, if not you know, better. You don't know that. So I, I think that's probably the best way to get at that. I suspect um, in most schools on balance, it's not going to be all that comparable. Uh, but I have not been in every single school, so who knows, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you haven't been in every single school. So I think, I think doing an audit like that would be really helpful. Okay, so and point. as a parent, I would like to see that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Manning. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Plucker, for being here and for your frankness on our situation. I agree with you that we have some incredible parents who've given us some wonderful feedback, and I also agree that they have a right to be upset with some of the things that have happened, um, but I'm glad that we're here now to try to come up with some solutions. Um, I am also a, a parent of two students that went through our division who were gifted. One... Um, and, and they experienced both. They experienced ODC, ODS, um, as well as the gifted model. And they are extremely different, in my opinion. Um, so I, I have several questions. My first is, and I don't mean to perseverate on this topic, but I think it's important because we've heard it so much. We are identifying almost triple the national average of students to be gifted. My first question is, in your opinion, are we properly identifying students based upon our current process? Uh, yeah, like I said before, I, I think you are. Um, you can probably tinker with it a little bit, but uh, I think most experts would, uh, would argue that 10% is too low in most cases. Um, uh, I mean, I don't, I, I don't like talking about percentages because a, a legitimate follow-up question is, well, exactly what should that percentage be? Yeah. I don't know. It, it totally depends. In some in some school districts, more kids who need more are five percent. In others, it's thirty percent. I just it really is district by district. So um, I don't think you're that far off where from from where you probably should be. Um, but again, like I'm not. I'm also not seeing data on exactly how students in the various service delivery models within Virginia Beach how they're reacting to it. So if you have a bunch of, if you have 10% of students who are really struggling with it and are not ready for it, then yeah, you've probably identified a third, a third too many. If, if they're all, if they're all thriving with it, then I would say you're probably about where you should be. So I, I would, I would look at the service as, I would look at the student outcomes more than I would the inputs on this, I guess is a, a better way to say it. Okay. And then my second question um, I really liked what you said about the hybrid hybrid model um, and the importance of um, using the curriculum, the ODS curriculum. I agree with you. It's phenomenal. And if we could get that into um, more, more of our schools, that would be great. Were you suggesting that perhaps we have so like satellite schools where you identify a couple of elementary schools where students from a variety of schools can come to those schools for that model? Uh, yeah, so it would sort of be a mini magnet school within a school model, I think. I think that could, I think that could work. Um, I mean, I, the challenge there is you don't want it to become ODS light because parents and students will see through that immediately. Um, uh, so if you're saying, okay, we're gonna sort of cluster students in a handful of schools to make sure we are providing this very rigorous curriculum to everyone who we think needs it, um, you need you need you, you need to be providing that 
curriculum and level of service. It can't be, well, kind of like ODS. No, it has, to, it, has, it has to be a very similar experience. Um, if you do that from my perspective, you are meeting the needs of the students that you have in front of you. And I, I think that's your goal. And it's, it's pretty much where, where you're falling short now. OK. And I, I think that could appeal to many families because one negative of going to ODS is you're very far away from your, um, your neighborhood you know, friends and your community. So I think that that could be a very positive model. And I'd, I'd like to explore that further. Um, and then the last thing, the opt-in versus opt-out, um, I'm familiar with the regulations on this topic. And the state code, I'm looking at it right here on the regulations, states that um, a parent must give consent. So wouldn't that require opting in rather than opting out? Uh, I mean, yes, in principle, but it really depends on how that is put into practice. So I think it's different from saying to parents, let us know if you want your child to be screened. That's like really opting in right. versus we have identified your student as one who would benefit from this. Uh, that's a very different question at a very different stage. Um, I think then, absolutely, talk to parents about it. Um, I think especially for lower income, recent immigrant families that don't have experience with advanced education, that then becomes a fantastic educational opportunity to help the family understand why this would benefit their child. Otherwise, it does sound a little weird sometimes from people who come from other countries, and we know that they tend to not opt in because they don't because because they don't really understand it. So I, I think you can actually use that to your advantage if you do it later in the process, after you've say universally screened. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Can I, can I uh, just? I, and I know we're short on time. Um, uh, I, one, one advantage of having sort of this bigger cluster satellite model um, is that uh, you're, much, you're much more flexible about scaling. And so, um, for example, uh, we, we, we've been starting to study um, things like self-nomination of students, of students who come to you and say, my friends are doing that. I can do that too. Um, in our experience, a significant percentage of them if given the opportunity, show that they can do it too. Within, within, with sort of a rigid ODS type of model, you have no, you, you have no flexibility for that. Um, and it's very disruptive if it, if, it, if it does work. And if it doesn't work, it's still crazy, um, just like, complicated. Um, but if, if you have those local embedded services, ha having a student try it for a few weeks, if it, if it works, great. You you have the scaling flexibility. If it doesn't, they go back to what they were doing, and they they will totally forget about it in a week, right? And so, like, it, it's sort of a low risk, high reward strategy. But with this, but with this current hybrid model, you can't really do that. And so, like, even sort of cutting edge things that we're starting to learn about, you kind of get hemmed in. And so, I I just think a flexible model is generally best for students and families. Okay, Miss Martin, and we have two more. Are we okay? I heard at the beginning we have 10 minutes for questions and answers, and we've exceeded that. So yeah. I think that nod meant he needs to give shorter answers. Okay. So I, I will okay. be, I'll be better about okay. that. Okay. Um, I'm thinking about what Ms. Weems said, um, and my background is, is um, university instruction um, and economic policy. So I think about this high performing student versus the gifted student as, as one who is compliant versus engaged with the content, right? So I have college students that get A's, they turn everything on time, papers are great, MLA's all great. You know, they're getting A minuses. It's not an exciting paper, though, right? So we've got that piece of what I think gifted education, right? You're really engaged with content. You're thinking outside of the box. Maybe you're not so great with turning things on on time, right? We've got to think through that piece of gifted education. Um, I'm also thinking about what my colleague said about the number of students we're identifying. We are a unique community with our military families who I think tend to be more strict and, and tend to stay on top of their, parent, their, their child's sure. education. So I looked up San Diego's identification of gifted students. It's kind of a similar community. Mm -hmm. That ranges from 18 to 39 percent. Yeah, um, it doesn't and, surprise me. Right, mm -hmm. right. And, and they're still working on their equity, equitable um, uh, component of that. My question for you is you mentioned a Maryland school district that went through a bumpy road on um, sort of transitioning to 
a cluster model in, in schools. Did they do that all at once or did they kind of do a phase out plan? Because I'm thinking about the cost of PD. If we're gonna enhance gifted clustering, is a better approach to kind of do it grade by grade? Like, hey, we're gonna get all our second grade teachers kind of up to, up to par on this new PD the next year, third grade, as we phase out students at the standalone. Is, is, what's, what's kind of your advice or insight on that? Oh, there's a lot there. Um, uh, I'm not surprised at the, San, at, the, at the San Diego numbers. My first elementary school teaching job, um, our school essentially served West Point families, and the percentage was well over 30%. So I, I totally agree with, agree with your logic. Um, I also uh, had to write a letter of recommendation for a student who is a perfect student on paper and doesn't excite me at all yesterday. And I sure hope they're not watching this. But, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, uh, we do get those students, right? Mm -hmm, we do. Um, uh, and I forget the crux of your final question. It was, um, you talked about a Maryland school that had a muppy room oh, yeah, yeah. closing they, out they, their they, school. They did it all at once. I think if they were here, they'd be like, we would never do that again. Um, they recovered from it eventually, but they would be the first ones to say, Ugh, our messaging was horrible. We didn't do enough quality control on what was happening in those clusters. I, I, and um, I think it's totally human nature, right? They got excited because conceptually they built a really good alternative model, much more inclusive, promoted much better student outcomes, and they decided to do it next year. And Boy, did that blow up. Um, it was just, it was so hard. And they still haven't ironed all the kinks out of it. This is a long-term process. Um, I, they should have eased into it more. I do think that PD is probably going to be your biggest challenge here. Um, just because, uh, university person, it's my fault too, when we're training future teachers, future principals, superintendents, um, we almost never talk about advanced education. And they just don't know. That's not their fault. Um, and so just helping them understand, hel helping them understand, bless you, helping them understand that the student who doesn't turn their uh, work in, more often boys than girls, but it can be girls too, um, that, that, that doesn't really mean anything. Like you, you, you should not be connecting dots that should be, shouldn't be connected. Um, sometimes it can be an indication that they're bored, right? And so... Um, uh, so just even basic PD like that, which I think you do pretty well here. Um, like you would be identifying at the percentages that you are if you weren't doing a lot of things really, really well. And I don't, I don't want that to be lost today. Um, but I, the next step is the hard one with professional development. Right. What I'm hearing from you is maybe when we look at our college prep programs, adding in some gifted education, gifted, gifted PD program at the college level could be helpful if we went Absolutely. to some kind of transition Absolutely. model. And we are facing economic headwinds. Can't open another school. Um, we're gonna have to tighten up this budget. That's what this big book is here. Um, so we're gonna have to find a solution that makes the majority of people happy. I don't think we'll make 100% of, of people happy at all. Um, could you share the name of that Maryland school district so we can? Montgomery, Montgomery County. County. Okay. I'm trying right. to think if we've written a profile of their experiences. If I have, I'll make sure that you get okay. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Brown and then Ms. Owens. And then we're done. So I have comments and questions that are very similar to those that my colleagues have asked. I'm going to yield. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to try and word it to capture what I'm thinking here, but... With our high school students, we don't offer a specific gifted program that's kind of equivalent to our ODS, which serves our elementary and middle school. And I assume that that is because at the high school level, we offer much more differentiated levels of learning and uh, a number of specialized interest programs within our high schools that uh, students can and families can choose what they feel like is going to be the best fit for their high school students. Um, when you mentioned your daughter and, and the state below us with the math program, it kind of struck me, is there, is there a piece uh, where we have students who are gifted or highly in need of more in math, but 
struggling in language arts and those students not being able to get the level that they would get at a standalone school like ODS because they're having these struggles in language arts where if the uh, cluster program was in place, is there a way to do those clusters where we are bringing kids in for math in that cluster, but they Absolutely. need to be in other, you know, kind of gen ed uh, situations for the other subject or vice versa? Yeah, that is a uh, fantastic point. It, um, it, again, it gives you flexibility. So that student who's a real high flyer in math who may be struggling with English, um, especially if English isn't their native tongue, right? Um, uh, we have plenty of uh, success stories across this country of taking recent immigrant students who can't speak English but are fantastic at math. But you have to look for those students and then you have to get them into like su suitably challenging, rigorous programs. Um, if, you're, if you're using sort of that bigger, bigger cluster model, um, uh, it, you do have a lot more flexibility for something like that. And, and, um, the um, high school issue is really interesting. Uh, people don't talk about it a lot in high school. Uh, and it's part because of things like AP, International Baccalaureate, honors courses. Um, uh, we are, are actually finishing a study now where we have been uh, surveying parents. And um, uh, the vast majority of parents don't differentiate among those different opportunities honors, APIB, et cetera, uh, dual uh, credit programs. Um, and that's an issue because we know that they're not all the same. But parents parents often don't understand that, right? Because um, an honors course, when we went to high school, an honors course was a big deal. Um, uh, we didn't have AP when I went to high school, which really, really dates me. But um, it, um, like an honors course is a big deal. It's a little bit less of a big deal now because of the differentiation we've done with other courses. So I do think that doing sort of an audit of advanced learning opportunities at the secondary level, um, you, you may find that everything's great. I think that's a good idea. Um, and uh, just to make sure it's working as well as you think it is and that families understand the different levels of rigor across the options that you have for them. Families often generally tell us that they didn't realize all the options their child had until they were graduating. That's, that, that's an us problem and not a them problem usually, right? So. Good. Dr. Plucker, thank you. Thank you. Always happy to come back and answer any questions or provide resources and things like that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Plucker. I hope that it is clear that the administration is open. Uh, we invited Dr. Plucker because we felt he's very objective um, and that the community, um, the board, and ourselves would benefit from hearing um, his feedback, um, his research and expertise. And we're all here to make the best decision we can. And like I said at the beginning, this is a complex um, situation we're in, um, but I think we all have the core purpose that we want to do the very best that we can. Um, we are a little short on time, so I will ask that as we go through, I'm going to invite Dr. Wilkerson up. She's going to walk through each decision area for which the, we need um, the, the board to really make a decision on. So I'm going to review quickly where we've come and what we've already decided and do a little bit of comparing just for context here and then we'll move in and Dr. Wilkerson will walk you through each one of the key decisions we need. In your red folder you have a plus delta graphic organizer and that may help if you're willing to jot your notes on that as she walks through each decision slide. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, mine's red. <laughs> um, you'll be able to note any pluses, so advantages that you perceive um, when you review uh, the feedback for each decision and the information and the administration's recommendation for those decisions or disadvantages. You may have um, a disagreement or a better solution in mind that you want to consider. The whole purpose here today is to help you make these decisions to give us the guidance we need to move forward. We have to have a selection process in place. 
And so we're asking for your help with that today. At the end, we did want to give you some small group time. We'll see where we are, but it might end up that we just have another discussion at the end and questions. Um, we certainly didn't want to cut that short because we know that you have questions and it's really nice to hear from Dr. Plucker when he's here with us. So um, let's go ahead and return. Um, I want to review these key things um, before we move on to looking at the decisions. Last year, um, as a reminder, this was the first year all first graders took both the Naglieri and the COGAD. So that was a difference last year. And it was also the first year that an application was automatically generated for students scoring a 90% or higher on either of those tests. I share this information because when we make decisions today, I want us to have a clear understanding of what was different last year and what was not different last year. Um, there were three individual scores, which is part of the local plan last year. So we adhered to that. The difference last year was that a consensus score was used after they individually scored separately. So we've heard feedback. I think you're going to be um, pleased with the feedback that has been um, taken very seriously from multiple uh, stakeholders, GCAC, the board, individual parent emails, and you'll see some changes and revisions to the amendments that have been brought to you already. Um, I do want you to also understand why that decision was made last year. I don't know that that's been clearly explained. In years past, parents were really also upset, groups of parents that um, one person threw off their child's perfect fours. And so this was a response to feedback that parents said, how can one person ruin my child's chance of um, having a 444? Um, and so it's not that decisions are made in haste. Um, we really want to work to do our best, like I said. Last year, um, a random selection of students with the highest ratings was done due to having more students um, with top ratings in grade two. Our current plan allows this, and it has been the practice for at least 15 years in the other grade levels. So I think that's also important to keep in mind when you have students getting those highest ratings, you have that dilemma that we face. Um, so now that we've discussed that, these are the key decisions we're looking for today. I'll give you a moment to look those over. Notice we left a column for other. Again, we're open. If there's something that you feel like we need to have um, a discussion on before we return to you February 13th, um, this is why we're here today, to sort through this together. And at this time, I welcome Dr. Wilkerson, our Director of K-12 and Gifted Programs, and she is going to walk you through each decision area. And again, while she's doing that, please take notes on your plus delta, and hopefully we will have time at the end to discuss your thoughts. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. During the October the 10th, 2023 school board meeting, we heard some members of the school board would like to continue the practice of having three people score each application individually, but do not wish for a consensus score to be recorded. It was shared that the administration should consider recording a triplicate score or three individual scores for each application. The administration has adapted the amendment to reflect this feedback to develop this recommendation. It can be revisited in the, when developing the next five-year plan. This will create multiple combinations of scores within the scale, should we find ourselves with fewer seats available. Please take a moment to note pluses and deltas. Recall that you will share your plus and delta feedback with each other at the end. Next, we are seeking a decision regarding the point range in the rating scale. I will share several slides related to the rating scale, and then we will pause to allow time to complete your plus delta. As a reminder, this four-point rating scale was not new last year. In 2021, 22, 
and 2022-23, we used the four-point scale. During the 2021-22 school year, we had enough seats available for students with a top rating in both second and sixth grade. To provide context for the change, please recall the school board was informed of this rating scale adjustment as were parents, GCAC, and community members prior to its use. Also recall if the school board approves the use of the triplicate scores as discussed on the previous slide, we will have multiple combinations of scores. Again, I will pause for you to jot any notes on your plus delta sheets and take notes for the four point scale and know that we'll be looking at a modified five point scale in just a moment. Here you will see the five point rating scale, which was last used in 2020, 2021. In previous years, we received feedback that this five point scale was not appropriate as the descriptor for a one was not recommended because all gifted students are eligible and recommended to apply for ODS if they wish. It, is also it also contained language such as definite yes, and it is clear that we cannot guarantee this and we must ensure transparency. Our planning, innovation, and accountability office team, who are experts in research and evaluation, offered considerations for each type of scale to inform this decision today. Note the important takeaway is that no single number of points for a rating scale is appropriate for all situations, and the criteria indicators matter most. There can be concerns when adding more points to rating scales because the more you add, the more subjective a scale can become, and it is more challenging to differentiate between ratings. However, this information also notes five points can allow for more nuanced evaluation if descriptors are clear enough. I'll pause again in case you want to jot any notes. Here, you see the 2020-2021 five-point scale with modifications to address the concerns regarding definite yes. It also includes a revised descriptor of the score of one. This could add a layer for outliers whose applications indicate they would not be successful. The administration can support either the existing four-point scale or the modified five-point rating scale as provided in this presentation. I will pause for a moment for you to look at this slide closely and jot down any notes related to the revised five-point scale on your notes page. We also need a decision to address the dilemma of what to do when not enough seats are available for students with top ratings. This happens yearly for most grade levels at ODS as seats become available prior to the start of the school year, particularly in grades three, four, five, seven, and eight. The practice has always been to use random selection for applicants with top ratings. Research shows that this reduces subjectivity and scrutiny related to adding more criteria and layers, which can lead to more subjective practices and questions for the division. In our current approved plan on page eight and 52, it states that we should consider the feasibility of implementing a lottery system for selecting identified students for available seats at ODS in grades two through eight. Our recommendation is to adopt the amendment to clearly to clarify the process to stakeholders and to continue to the use of random selection when there are fewer seats available than students with the highest ranking. We also heard from the school board that additional parent information may be helpful. We wanna remind the school board that pre previous concerns shared with us regarding too much information from parents. This could lead to exclusionary practices, such as families with limited English, foster children, and families without inter internet access that may face barriers. 
Our recommendation is to look at reasonable and fair options when developing the next five-year plan. Therefore, we respectfully request to maintain the practice of not requiring the component that we have omitted for the past two years, which would task families and our teachers with a short turnaround time for collection. Again, I will pause briefly for you to reflect on your plus delta sheet. This amendment is to ensure accuracy of content in the plan and does not cause a change in the process, nor does it impact staff or schools. The use of the word placement is confusing for parents and stakeholders, as gifted cluster services and ODS are both full day with time built in for lunch and electives. The Code of Virginia guarantees students identified as gifted receive gifted services. There is not a requirement for a placement outside of the zone school. So this language makes this more clear. ODS is an optional opportunity that our division offers. Our recommendation is to modify the language as seen here and in your amendment materials throughout the plan. Again, I will pause so that you can capture any notes at this time. Next, I want to share the feedback from our Gifted Community Advisory Committee. Although not a requirement, we benefit from a community advisory board to support VBCPS in soliciting community feedback. We are thankful to be partners with GCAC in this work. This slide shows what the state specifies as the two responsibilities of the Gifted Community Advisory Committee. Displayed here are the two items the GCAC confidently came to consensus on at our January 8th GCAC meeting. The GCAC and administration agreed eliminating a consensus score is preferred. The GCAC also came to consensus regarding the point range of scales. They prefer a five-point scale be used. Note, consensus was not met for addressing the dilemma of supply and demand for our ODS seats. Rich discussion took place with diverse viewpoints shared by individual GCAC members regarding other decision items as well. Some felt that a straight lottery could be used as all gifted learners are gifted and entitled to being in a random selection. Another shared an idea for the next plan to expand seats by considering making ODS a school for three through eight grades, grades three through eight. Additionally, some felt strongly that parent information should not be expanded. The value in a group like this is that they can discuss these varying perspectives and opinions openly. When consensus is captured, we as a division take note of that as well. In conclusion, we're looking for direction on these items and have provided you with our best recommendations. We appreciate your thoughtfulness and your partnership as we work together to make these important decisions. Before you begin your collabor collaboration discussion, I want to point out that on the amendment proposal in your folder, you'll see that the four-point rating scale is noted. We'll update that proposed document to reflect either the four-point or the five-point scale based on your feedback today for the information session on February the 13th. Please note that we also removed the previously proposed amendment stating when the plan is silent, the school administration has authorization to make reasonable interpretation with notice to the school board based on your feedback. The next plan will provide a great opportunity for us to dive even deeper into this work and to support us in operationalizing larger changes. At this time, Mrs. Colucci will lead us in the collaboration time that we have embedded. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilkerson. So now it is time, um, and I do think we do have a little bit of time to allow you to just debrief, process, look through those again um, with each other in a small group. 
So um, if you could take 10 minutes to go through any notes, your thoughts, um, maybe you want to identify the ones that you really want to discuss a little bit further, and then we'll return to the whole group um, and have some discussion. And if you have any questions or feedback you really want us to hear today before we return to you on February 13th um, with information and any other adjustments. So um, we'll start the timer now, um, and if you can just group up with two or three members and collectively talk about that, and we'll return to the whole group.
psychometrics are different when it's categorical levels as opposed to the Likert scale, where it's assumed to be continuous for the most part. So that I don't know what the research is. Like four versus five versus seven. If it's a categorical scale, that actually matters a lot. But I but I don't I, I'm not familiar with that research at all. This sort of task seven feels like a lot to me. Five, though? It would be interesting to see what you have lying around because that um, money's only, only, money's only getting tighter or so. But yeah, we can talk about that some more. So I'm going to bring us back together at this time. So we had the five decisions. There was a little discussion um, getting ahead. So there, I think that some seeds were planted um, for some different ideas, and that's, that's great. Um, those would be more appropriate for when we're developing the five-year plan. So it's kind of hard because we want to look forward and start creating or um, ideating on some solutions. Um, but for today, we in, a, in just a couple weeks, we have to have a process in place to close this year out and um, make sure that we move forward. So um, we have long-term goals um, and great opportunities ahead. Um, but what I'm going to ask now is that if we could do a straw vote. So if there are any questions that need to be clarified before we do a straw vote for each of these decisions so that we can be ready um, on the 13th, um, that would be very helpful um, to the administration. Um, so if there are any questions, the team is here. Um, yep, yeah, Mrs. Owens. I'm asking mm -hmm. a question that I'm actually... Uh, kicking over to David and putting him on the spot. But um, in our group, our small group, we uh, looked at the, the rating score range, and we have a question uh, about a third option with that before we, we vote. And I'm going to kick it to David since it was his idea, but I, I thought it was a good one. Okay. Uh, we're talking about the rating scale, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I said it before, I'm a fan of the five-point scale. Uh, the concern is that if you make, you know, a one lower than the other four we've already talked about, that you start to bring in the equity concerns that you're, you're going to pick on kids. Uh, I would, I'm still a fan of the five-point scale, but I actually think you should add something at the top of the scale, not the bottom. And I would make the same four that you listed for your four, which is a uh, few consistent areas of strength, show strength, strong is a, four, is a three, consistently strong is a four. And I would make a five exceptional in all application components. In other words, you know, this is the kid as a raider. I want to stand up at the table and go, this kid. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And if I reviewed 200 applications, I might have four or five of those. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we can consider that. Sometimes it gets, it. you know, to be very honest, we've gone back and forth with some wordsmithing as well, obviously, and it gets hard to define. Consistently strong, exceptionally strong, and so it is a dilemma, but I appreciate yeah. that feedback, um, and we will go another, back to the right. team. One way or another, it is subjective. There's yeah. no way around that. People are involved. You're correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. team has noted that. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on to the straw vote? Okay. That's fine. We can definitely do that. <laughs> but, but there has to be, you guys, we also have to give you guys the autonomy to decide really if the have is the right way to go. I mean, it sounds great, but I still think a lot of kids are going to be left out of that. And I worry about that piece. Um, uh, I, I understand it in theory. I really, really do. Um, you know, I worry about the consensus piece too. And I hope parents understand that it's a random draw who you get, who's going to be the three people who are going to be doing your kid, who are going to be evaluating your kid. And with that consensus piece missing, we're going to have a child, it's inevitable that we're going to have a child that appears to be this exceptional to somebody, and somebody's going to be left with, how did, the, how did not my kid not, not get that? Because somebody was left not being able to fight for this because they saw something that you didn't. I worry about all of this just because it's subjective and we're humans. Every year there's parents who are not pleased. Every single year. Every year. Every year. And so we, we will not eliminate that. We will eliminate the amount of this program. Well, at the beginning we said there was a column for other. And so I want to honor that. Um, and we'll review both when we go through this. All right. All right. So looking at the, the slide, um, could we have a straw vote on who would um, be comfortable and in favor of adopting the three individual scores? And Mrs. Manning is online. And we have 11. Ms. Manning did raise her hand. Okay, great. Um, the next decision we need is the rating scale. So... Um, yeah, yes, so let's do this three times. The, the four-point scale, who's in favor of that? Mrs. Manning? Mrs. Manning? I'm just... in favor of the five-point. Okay. Um, who is in favor of the modified five-point scale as presented in the slides? In, in our slides. Ms. Manning, did you approve the modified slide, the five-point slide that was presented? So I'm confused. Are there is there more than one five-point scale? Yes, Mr. Culpepper um, made a suggestion. He made Mrs. Manning. Uh, he made the suggestion that we enhance the rating criteria for the score of five to say exceptionally. So I'm in favor of a five-point scale, and I'm flexible on what that looks like. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, and then let's do the straw vote on Mr. Culpepper's suggestion with the modified five-point scale with some wordsmithing to make the five exceptionally strong. Okay. And we have 10 eyes in favor of that. Thank you. 
The next decision we ask to be made would be the process to implement. If there are fewer seats than students with the highest score, I'm going to reiterate, we do not put every student in for a random selection. Only the ones that would get the highest score according to the five-point rating, and that would be, if you do adopt this later, a 555, and all three would be recorded. So students, if we would have that dilemma, which we may not moving forward um, with the changes you're making, um, we would use a random selection. Who is in favor of that? Yes, sir. I just want to clarify what you said. Uh, Let's just say we're drawing, you have 200 seats available. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had 100 fives uh, and let's say 154s, mm -hmm. the fives would be in, right? And then the yeah. random draw would the be fours the fours. The fours are not correct? in that selection. So the random draw would be the fours. No, if there were, let's say there were 130 seats available and we had 155 with a 555, five, five, so we had a surplus sure. of 25, that the That's not my question. Okay. That I understand. Okay. Hopefully, we, we go to uh, individual scores and a five-point scale. We won't be in that position, right? Correct. We'll have, would you say, 125 seats? Yeah, Whatever the number is. 130. Mm -hmm. 130. We have 130 seats. You'll have 75, let's say, with the highest score of five. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the remaining seats, it would be the next It would the be next the five, five, five fours. There you go, the five, mm -hmm. five, fours. The mm -hmm. five, five, fours is where the random draw would be, correct? Yes, okay. and then so on. Yes, Mrs. Owens. Just for clarification, I understand that for our second and sixth grade groups, but for our third, fourth, fifth, families that are applying, if we had 10 kids who had the 555s five, five and they're trying to get into third or fourth grade and there's three seats available and they all have 555, five, five, at that point I assume that those ones who have the same scores would do the... Uh, random selection process yes the scores that, that we have available for them right um, would be used so keeping in mind that some students will have that score that they receive during the last identification process okay mm -hmm. just making sure because it, it does mm -hmm. kind of set the precedent mm -hmm. that that could happen and that want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with with that uh, miss manning has her hand raised to get into the queue One more, one more question. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'll better let Ms. Manning go first. <laughs> go ahead, Ms. Manning. Okay, I'm having some trouble with this one, and, and I think it might be a little bit of a trust issue <laughs> based upon what happened in the past. If we have 10 extra students that are exactly the same on paper, you can't really figure it out, I'm fine with a random lottery draw, but if we have 100 students, I'm not okay with that. So how do you propose handling that situation? So if they all were scored at a 555, Mrs. Manning, and we, were, we had um, 10 more students than we did with available seats, we would implement the random selection with those 555s. So if we had scores say they're scoring everybody five five five, we could end up with a situation of there's a lottery draw for all hundred and thirty seats like we had last year. So I'm yeah. just looking at it from all different Correct. perspectives mm -hmm. of what could happen and for that reason I just don't feel that I can approve that. Okay. Oh now Mr. Sorry, Parker. do you remember what I was gonna ask you? Um, you pointed out in your slides here that the um gifts uh, Advisory Committee did not have a consensus on how to deal with this. They could not. Can this you, is a dilemma. Can you give me an idea of what the prevailing uh, thoughts were? Dr. Wilkerson. So um, there was a lot of discussion about this, and it was exactly what they just talked about. Um, there was, um, I think, a mix, I would say, for what their thoughts were, and part of their um, conversation was around um, this this random selection, but then there was also some discussion of holistic lottery, like everyone is being considered for this, um, regardless of the levels. So there was a um, there was a mix of, um, of viewpoints during that meeting. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Kelly? She 
uh, Dr. Wilkerson captured it, I think that the conversation that the committee of uh, the group started to have was once you have five five fives, how would you break it down? Because they've already met the mm -hmm. criteria of you know very very strong or exceptionally strong above. Uh, so that's kind of where they got kind of stuck. And so that's where the conversation led of we don't identify bands of giftedness, which I know we've had conversations around. So once you're at a, a certain level, you're at a certain level. And we don't, we want to ensure that we're offering the services to those students as well. No, we have to just keep, we'll just keep going. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right. So the, a lot of the question around this dilemma is scrutiny. So the, the more you get into adding layers, the more the division puts themselves in a place of, did you do the most fair thing? Right. And I can appreciate everyone's viewpoints related to it. Um, so let's go ahead and do oh, the before, straw before vote. Before you go on, Ms. Yes. Means has a question. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brown, yes. Oh, I'm, well, actually, I told her she was next, and then you picked it. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. With the with the Raiders, uh, I'm one of three Raiders, and I've been trained, I'm yes. assuming, and I know that you've gone over that. So, is a five, like, you can have a student on paper that, because you, you have to get the 90th percentile of these tests. Okay. If we're just talking the test. Say every... Say everything else is kind of the same with their mm -hmm. the other stuff. So are the Raiders saying, okay, well, this child is 9, 91st percentile, and then this child is 99th on everything. Is that, are they using that to differenti differentiate how they're Yes, rating? they have to look holistically, okay, so and they everything. get training on the rating. I do, personal opinion, I'll be clear, I do think it's unlikely we will find ourselves in this situation. Um, with the changes that it seems that you're all in favor of making. Okay, there are no guarantees, <laughs> um, but I do think we are minimizing um, that likelihood. I just point out that you will be in that situation, but it probably won't be over 100 kids. It'll be over five or 10. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so to me, this is kind of the sticky wicket. Mm -hmm. um, I don't like a random selection lottery, whatever it want, whatever we're going to call it, um, process. I do, I would like to see some sort of differentiation. However, I also would note um, that if we were going to change how five is rated, that there were probably be quite a substantial reduction in number fives. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to be able uh, to support this amendment um, for a random draw just because I do believe there should be um, some sort of a tiebreaker, if you will. Um, and that's, that's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. So with that said, how feasible is it to take those fives that we have remaining and then do a second tier evaluation? I guess that's, that's just a question. I, I, I just want to hear in theory, you know, how would that look and is it even feasible to, to put that in place? It would be very challenging. We pull people out of buildings to do the scoring, to train them from their regular duties supporting students. Uh, and so you would be looking at, an, at a challenge. Um, I think that I would recommend you, you think about these things and we can work with the community as well in our GCAC for the next five-year plan operationally within the timeline right now. That would be very challenging. And I do think we would have a lot of questions being asked about how did you do that? The first raiders were trained, and this was my child's score, and then they were removed. Um, and so I think yeah. it becomes very difficult. 
So at this time, um, straw voting for uh, the process to implement. If there are fewer seats, if you could please show if you're in favor of the amendment that the administration recommended. If it, if to yeah. do a random yeah. selection of the students receiving the highest rating. So we have seven eyes. Thank you. The next decision that we will ask for a straw vote on is the parent information. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. You said, it would be like, you said it would be very challenging to do it a second tier. A second tier this time. Yeah, I think. But we, mm -hmm. I, and I get that. Mm -hmm. But but you said this time because of the time. But maybe the next five year plan we could look. At, I is think that what we you said? should look at everything that the board and the community is sharing to okay. define that. You know, what would that involve right now? Um, in this moment, I'm thinking, you know, we're pulling a lot of people off their duties, serving kids, administrators that are supervising their buildings, psychologists that are delivering services. All of these people are leaving their duties to do this with a high quality selection group. So what I'm, point, what I'm getting to is trying to point out is we've moved along with with this, you know, this plan and where we can move, mm -hmm. but this is our maybe our next step that we could really look yeah. at. So, this is the next step. I mean, I you know, agree. We've done a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. There's still room to grow, and we can do that. We just can't do it right now. But yes. I just wanted to point that out. That's and I think you. in the future, you'd also have to consider the backlash of a decision like that. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. So, on this section, it says student achievement standardized test scores. And so I would venture to guess that this population, gifted population, has quite a bit more test anxiety um, than maybe some of our other students. So that concerns me that we're bringing in those, those test scores. And that I'd also like to see us not look at just the most current report card, but all the way back to K, so we can get a bigger picture. So for instance, we have a student go through a family crisis, maybe that last quarter grades aren't great. Um, so that's just a couple of concerns I have with mm -hmm. that part. Teacher information, GRT info, and, and the task and interview questions, all great. I'm just a little concerned about those top two and that compliance versus critical thinking skill piece. Mm -hmm. So parent information, mm -hmm. the amendment um, that the recommendation from the administration is to adopt the amendment to add the performance task to illustrate problem solving skills and provide more data for the selection committee. Analyze best practices for collecting more parent information when developing the next five-year plan. So, so you're saying the parents would be involved in the, in, in the planning development, but not that the parents would be filling out forms saying why their child, okay, right? Yes, so okay. they're giving consent. They can always have conferences with teachers and GRTs throughout the process, but a narrative or something like that would not provide a weighting for a child okay. um, and impact scoring as it stands now. Correct. We do hear feedback that there's some people that feel in the next five-year plan we should relook that and try to see if there are other fair ways to do that then, and we are, we are going to do that later. Um, so the recommendation to close out this five-year plan is to basically have it as is mm -hmm. with what has been used for the last <clears throat> couple of years. So that is what I'm asking for a straw vote on now. Okay. Can you please add, uh, Ms. Manning has her hand raised for comment. Okay, Ms. Manning, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanna clarify, because um, I'm looking at the regulations. Can a parent still give a referral for their student? To be tested? And considered, so. is that your because question? Yes. Anyone actually can refer a child to be tested for gifted, not even just a parent. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
Regina, did we need to do that one again? Okay. <laughs> so those in favor? We have 11 ayes. Thank you. And then the final decision uh, is basically clarifying language. Um, we have received feedback, uh, as Dr. Wilkerson said, that it was unclear. It led to misconceptions and confusion. Uh, we're working towards trust um, and clarity and transparency, and we believe this language will help to provide that. So this amendment and the recommendation would be to adopt this amendment to modify language as seen here and throughout the plan to ensure stakeholder clarity. Those in favor? Ms. Brown had a question first. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, yes, can you explain um, why full time is being clarified for removal instead of um, just the word enrollment? Yes, and so we may have different opinions on this mm -hmm. about what I will share with you. Um, the gifted cluster is full time. So they are expected to plan alongside the gifted resource teacher to design curriculum. They're trained by our gifted coordinators and teams and consultants. Uh, and so they are providing full time placement in a gifted cluster model. So it's confusing if we make it seem like that they're with a, a gifted cluster some of the time. And that was something that we found ourselves explaining um, and that there wasn't very consistent understanding of that. So that is why they're both full time. Okay, but this is specific to ODS. Well, so. this is in the plan, though. Okay. This affects everything. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So those in favor? We have nine ayes. We have built in time for a break. Yes, we have. That. And so <laughs> if it's okay with my colleagues, can we take that from 15 to 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, I'll see you at, what, what is 155? So I'll see you at 205. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, hello again, Ms. Mrs. Car Colucci. Um, as we move on to the preview of process and timeline for the development of the 25 through 30 gifted education plan. Yes, to begin, I just want to thank you. Um, this is complicated. Uh, we said that throughout, um, and we just truly appreciate your time and thoughts and feedback, and we're going to keep working to make sure that's reflected. So looking at the next steps that you see here, um, our plan is to return to you on February 13th for information with amendments, some further revisions um, to be reflected in those uh, so that you have all of that information. Um, and then we hope to have consent on these decisions by February 27th so that we can proceed with the process that needs to take place um, to ensure we're ready for the next school year. And um, at this time, Dr. Wilkerson is going to take just a few minutes to explain the big long-term next steps, which is how we develop uh, the five-year plan um, for the education of the gifted so that that process is clear to you and what those steps will involve. So. <laughs> they told me this clicker was going to be tricky. Any tips? <laughs> oh, just needed Danielle to touch it. Okay. So this spring, stakeholders will be contacted and provided with the opportunity to participate in developing the next five-year plan for the education of the gifted. An initial meeting with the entire team will take place and subcommittees will begin to meet. 
Throughout the fall, subcommittees will develop our draft. The Office of K-12 and gifted programs will combine subcommittees work with the full plan and provide a draft to the school board by spring of 2025 in order to gain consent. <clears throat> so let's take a moment to ensure that the work ahead is clear outside of the amendment to the current plan. As you can see from this slide, multiple stakeholders will be included and participate across five subcommittees in the development of the 2025-2030 gifted plan. This will include the gifted community advisory committee and members of the GCAC will also be divided among the five subcommittees as it has been in the past. The subcommittees will review the school division's 2020-2025 20, 2020, local plan, the National Association for Gifted Children Pre-K through Grade 12 gifted programming standards, the VBCPS graduate profile, the equity plan, and other pertinent documents in order to ensure that this plan fully addresses and aligns with Compass to 2025 and our vision for the future of gifted education services in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. The 2020-2025 local plan is comprised of six areas required by the state. Each area includes a goal and supporting objectives and activities as we shared previously. The full plan describes each activity. The six areas required by the Virginia Department of Education include identification with the goal of providing a systematic identification process that reflects the delivery of services. Delivery of services with the goal of providing a comprehensive continuum of services which addresses the needs of all gifted students. Curriculum and instruction with the goal of providing differentiated curriculum and instructional opportunities reflective of the unique needs of all gifted students. Professional development with the goal of providing continuous differentiated professional development for all school staff on identification and education of gifted and talented students. And parent and community involvement with the goal of pro promoting the awareness of the unique needs of gifted students among parents, school staff, and the community. You will notice that the area of equitable representation of students calls out the processes and opportunities that were previously established in each of the other five areas and is inclusive of students with diverse abilities, beliefs, and cultures during the identification and education of gifted and talented students. We appreciate your support with all areas of the plan development. That concludes the brief on the process used to develop our next five-year plan. And at this time, we are all available for questions. Okay, Ms. Franklin. Thank you. Um, a couple of things that we hadn't touched on in, in this amazing presentation was, one, we have heard concerns about the appeals process. Will that be discussed as we go forward with um, um, proposing the next plan? So the conversation for the appeals process will definitely be part of the conversation as we move forward with the next um, plan. So just to, to clarify, our appeals committee meets, we review um, those appeals, and then we, we determine what our um, next steps might be. And those next steps usually fall into three categories. One might be, does the student need additional testing? Um, are we maintaining the score that was originally given, or um, are we going to change that score after the review from that appeals process? That is our current appeals process, and we will um, continue to, to work collaboratively with all those stakeholders we just mentioned okay. to talk about if changes need to be made um, for the next five-year plan. And then I did have one question, which I don't ever remember hearing in, in these presentations. So let's say you have a student that goes to ODS, mm -hmm. and they're having um, behavioral or problems just keeping up with the curriculum because it, it's, it's my, my son went to KLMS. So, I mean, um, I can tell you that the, that's one reason he decided to go back to his homeschool because he, he found that um, he just thrived better when, when, you know, outside of that setting. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
one one of the things that I wanted to just ask you is during that time that they're there at ODS, are they can, getting continually evaluated as a student to ensure that, or having uh, discussions with parents, perhaps you, your child would thrive? I, I'm just curious if they have those kinds of evaluations throughout their time there. Are you talking specifically for academics or behavioral concerns? Well, well, both. If, if they're finding that they're struggling keeping up, maybe they would be better in um, a, a homeschool because you know the pressure is great there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, or if they choose to, um, you know, just have a discussion about, you know, some behavior that might be coming um, out because of frustration. I'm, I'm just curious, do, do those discussions happen at ODS? Those are typically um, conversations that happen not only during parent um, when they when they have their ongoing meetings, but also during student response team meetings when we're talking about responding to students' needs. Mm -hmm. um, so those are usually conversations that are held during those times. But yes, those conversations do are happening. Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. I do have if if a student after the first nine weeks decides that it's not the right placement for them. Um, and there is a waiting list. Do we fill that waiting list? At the, do, or is it just an open? I mean, tell me what we do there. So our list, um, it, it goes away at the start of the school year. Okay. So we don't fill those um, spots. And traditionally, they, we haven't had those um, those open seat issues. Okay. But, um, but no, we do not have a waiting list for during the school year once the school year starts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. you all for, for all of this information. This was, this was great. Um, we are now going to move on to the discussion on school board summer retreat topics. And um, Dr. Robertson shared with me some topics that he's captured along the way. And so um, as we mention these, let please let us know what else um, you might be interested for this summer. Um, so we have PBIS, declining enrollment and its impact on rezoning and school closings or mergers. Um, the ODS five-year plan, not sure if that can come off now with all of this. We would still want to make sure that we seize that opportunity to engage the board in any conversation. Anything updates. additional, even though that's stepped out. Okay. All yes. right. That's fine. Um, a strategic plan update and the opportunity to establish expectations for the 25-26 school calendar. So PBIS, declining enrollment, ODS five-year plan, strategic plan update. Uh, school calendar. And, and I would offer that um, we have plenty of time to mm -hmm. finalize the agenda. Uh, normally, you guys have all been a part of one of these retreats. You normally have a, a, about six windows to have conversations. We have five right now. So we, we can make adjustments all the way up until probably May because then that gives the team June to get all the presentations together for July. But uh, those were the five that I know have kind of resonated with the board at this point, in my opinion, and certainly they're up for discussion. Okay. Can you say them one more time? Please? Yes, sure. One more time. PBIS, mm -hmm. declining enrollment, ODS five-year plan, the strategic plan update, and school calendar 25-26. Yes. Dr. Robertson, that topic that we discussed earlier today, um, do you think that would be appropriate for that? It, it could be. Okay. Um, and that topic is, Ms. Brown actually had a, yep. a question about that. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah um, so I believe it was June 27th we had gotten an update um, as it relates to dual enrollment, AP courses, and waiting. Um, and I was looking to see... Um, we could get an update on that. Um, I prefer it to be sooner than the retreat. Um, you know, and I, I think that um, about this time last year, you know, in the middle of the discussions about um, 
valedictorian, salutatorian class rank, we had kind of promised the community that we would dive into that. So I'd like to do that. Yeah, and, and Ms. Brown, Ms. Franklin, and Ms. Melnick brought that up today in an earlier discussion with Dr. Saltner and myself. And um, Ms. Franklin actually requested if we could get it in February, and I told her that. And we're kind of filled in February, but certainly we can look at the next quarterly forecast. It'd probably be more timely to do it in March or April than wait till July. I would agree with that. That's the same thing that we said we would bring back, yeah, February, March, yeah. Okay, right. And, and just for the record, the weighted courses um, has been, it, it, it's, it's been a topic of conversation for quite some time, and um, it, it's been years, and so um, I think we've finally reached the time where it needs to be addressed. So anything further? So yeah. So would that include um, waiting some of the classes that are take that the governor's school takes? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can talk on that. Okay. Okay. So no, no more additions at this point. Of course, you always have the ability to to email and discuss further. Um, at this point, um, we're going to go into closed session, mm -hmm. and so. Um, Madam Vice Chair, if you could take care of that, please. Make a motion to move the school board to recess into closed session in accordance with the exceptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711, Part A, Paragraph 1, 2, 3, 7, and 8, as amended, to deliberate on the following matters. One, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body, and evaluation of performance of departments or schools of public institutions of higher education, where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals, two, discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters, or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution of higher education in the Commonwealth or any state school system. Three, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for a public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating stra strategy of the public body. Consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consulta consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing in open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. Consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or as consultant on a matter. Namely to discuss superintendent search, discussion regarding superintendent contract and related matters, discussion with staff regarding status of certain matters related to real property related to educational services, status of certain student related investigations and related matters, status of pending litigation or administrative cases, and finally consultation with legal counsel regarding probable litigation and pending litigation matters. Okay, motion made by Mrs. Franklin. Is there a second? Seconded by Mrs. Owens. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we are in closed session. Oh, I'm sorry. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Raise your hand. Raise Any your opposed? Hand. No, Ma we're in closed session. Madam Chair, we have um, 10 ayes to go into closed session. Excellent. Thank you.
City of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting on the state pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and whereas section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the City of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Okay. okay. All in favor? We have eight ayes. The motion did pass for certification of closed. 